This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics. We promise to do our best to keep it both insightful but brief. On this episode, we have a returning guest, Amir Gadradi, Director, Market Insights at App Any. Amir, welcome back to the Business of Apps podcast. Yeah, hey, it's, uh, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Terrific. Thanks for coming back. All right, so we were waiting for 2020 to over so strong. So here's 2021. It's February is about to over. Can you believe that? But wait, there's something special about February. I can tell you what. Last February, we had App Any, the world's famous app analytics and app data company, to talk about the State of Mobile 2020 report. And today, we will be covering the State of Mobile 2021. So let's roll and let's start with the five major data points that you guys provide in each report. These are new app downloads, app store spend, daily time spent per user, mobile ad spend, and venture capital to mobile tech. So these numbers, I think, give people kind of a bird view on the app ecosystem. So why you've decided to highlight these numbers in particular? And what are specific numbers we've got for these numbers, for these figures in 2020? Yeah, so the you know the state of mobile report that App Annie produces is one that we've been doing annually for for quite a few years at this point, and there's a lot of really interesting content in there for a variety of verticals, and even talking about marketing and advertising and actionable insights in terms of what people could potentially do with this information. So there's just a lot of information that that people can go through. But one of the things we always want to make sure that we have in there is, you know, that, that section up front that just says, you know, hey, there's a lot of information in here. If you only wanted to remember five basic things about what's mm-hmm. going on, to give you a good sense of the direction of the mobile app economy. Like these are these five things. They're they're simple, they're easy to remember, and they're right up front. So you can kind of take that, take that with you. So the first one we have is just that there's you know 218 billion downloads in 2020, which is up 7% from, from 2019. So people are still downloading apps and it's a higher number than, than expected. And then we see $143 billion in consumer spend. For the year, and so spend went up by twenty percent year over year. So that's that's a very large growth there as well. We also saw that daily time spent per user went up twenty percent to four point two hours per person per day. So not only are more people using mobile in general, the time per person is also going up, which is how you you get such big growth. On the advertising side, we saw more advertising spend move over to mobile, so more in time with where we're spending our, our time. So now it's up 26% to $240 billion in mobile ad spend for the year. And then finally, for venture capital and, and where their money is going, we saw an increase of 27%. So now we're up to $73 billion in, in VC to mobile tech. So successful companies, a lot of them are having a very strong mobile component in them. And what does this all say when you look at those five things together, right? Mobile is big. It's continuing to grow. And with the things that have happened in the past year, especially with the pandemic, we've seen the industry advance by two to three years in a span of of 12 months. Yeah, this this is what people say. uh, The acceleration of the mobile ecosystem, stuff that you would expect in a few years happened within a year and by the way, I can personally testify that my daily stats for the app usage on my iPhone is pretty much on par with this 4.2 hours <laughs> per day. So I am on average. I'm one of the folks who were uh, in this number of per uh, daily usage. All right. So let's dive deeper into these data points and let's touch on app discovery first. So this is the important point, like, uh, you know, from the inception of the app ecosystem, app discovery has been the important thing on every app marketing manager agenda, like, uh, you know, any planning for app marketing strategy always brings up this app discovery problem. How do we make sure that (laughs) our apps are being discovered by people like this is why we're working with the app marketing team. So how did people find new apps to download last year? 
Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's millions of apps in, in the app stores, right. You know, across iOS and, and Google play. So to your point, you know, app, app discovery is a, a very big part of the, the ecosystem. There's a lot of uh, optimization set up around what happens when people get to your app page and how to convert them in terms of downloading, but just even getting to them, them to that page is such a, a big component in terms of success. A lot of, a lot of, Downloads still come from people, you know, like actively searching for something in the page, right? And we're still hovering around that 65% of, mm -hmm. of downloads are coming people from people just searching for something in, in the app store itself. So a lot of times by the time someone is searching in the app store, you know, they have a general idea of what it is that they're that they're looking for. And a lot of the terms are actually like branded terms, right? They might right. be aware of something from outside the app store and actually just searching for it. Uh, within there. So you might see it as a result of searching for a specific app. You might see it for surfing, searching for a specific functionality like food delivery, for, for example. Uh, and then there's also going to be, you know, different apps that are advertising that will appear in, in those, in those search results as well. So that's one of those reasons why it's really important to just see, you know, where your apps rank for a variety of keywords and just seeing not only where you rank for those keywords, but how popular those keywords are and also, you know, how easy it would be for you to move up in, in those rankings, which is, you know, something we look at as, as a company as well with, with our estimates. Uh, but that's, that's a very big component there. And one of the things that's big for this year, you know, I already mentioned 218 billion apps, new apps download or new app downloads, right? And one of the things that's interesting about that going up 7% year over year is just that, you know, when people have their devices, you know, they don't need to keep re-downloading the same apps. Right. Definitely. So you expect an individual's user's downloads to kind of go down uh, over time. As time spend goes up, as consumer spend goes up, you know, downloads is the one that kind of drops a little bit first. And there was just a sudden shock to the system that people were looking after or looking at downloading apps that they hadn't necessarily considered before. So in some case, out of looking for entertainment or connection, and in some cases, out of convenience, others out of necessity. So you see a lot of people engaging with apps in a way that they hadn't been engaging before. And that's why this is you know, kind of the perfect time for user acquisition, right? People are on the, on the hunt for, for new apps. Yeah, because of the pandemic, it looks like mobile got even bigger part of the people's life, like things that did, they didn't consider to go or to do or via mobile, all of a sudden they didn't have any option other other just to get an app to do this thing that previously they could just do uh, offline. And yeah, the lack of mobility, they're, they're, they're stuck at home. They need to something to entertain themselves more. They, you know, they, they need to continue living and like trying to compensate the part that was taken away because of the pandemic using apps. And um, yeah, so you are attributing that huge jump, not to the fact that, you know, more uh, mobile devices were sold because the number wasn't that hugely, you know, bigger than the 2018, and sorry, 2019, but because, because of COVID people had to uh, compensate like this offline part of their life that it was taken away via mobile apps, right? Yeah, and I mean, you, you know, even with new devices being sold or people using their existing devices, the number would still be quite high. It would just be closer to holding steady versus mm -hmm. a 7% increase. One thing that people also underestimate, you know, if you, if you did a survey talking about this versus, you know, looking at our estimates to see what, what people are, are you know, really doing, uh, people also tend to significantly understand like how much they download apps and also how many apps they use and how many apps are on their, on their device. You know, if you if you ask someone how engaged they are with mobile from from that perspective, they tend to give a number that's that's relatively low. But then if you you know start counting through all the things that they're doing, you know, whether you're taking notes or using various social apps or you're going to the bank or you're getting grocery delivery or all these other sorts, you know, how many streaming services you have, all these different sorts of, of, of engagements. You, know, you start to see that, oh, OK, well, people are actually using about 40 different apps per month and you know, on, on average, in most countries, people are going to have, you know, 100 apps installed on, on their device at any given point in time, especially because storage space isn't as much of an issue for, for most devices anymore. And, you know, not only with larger storage on phones, but also with, with cloud storage and things like that. So people have a lot of apps, they use a lot of apps. 
And then from the from the publisher side, right, just even having your app on a device is a very big win because you can start doing push notifications and other types of re-engagement mm-hmm. campaigns, right? It's a lot easier to bring someone back to using your app once you're on the device, you know, versus getting them to to download something for the for the first time. And you know, the vast majority of people aren't going to download apps unless there's an active reason why they need to download them or why why they need to delete them, right? Which might be, you know, hey, I'm running out of space or it's using up too much battery, or there's some sort of security concern that I read about in the news, you know, things, things like that. Yeah, just get rid of a Facebook app. <laughs> okay, so there are three numbers in your report that I think are the most important ones that give you a really nice picture of the scale of the uh, app ecosystem right now, specifically app store spend, daily time spend per user, and new app downloads. So we're talking about like how many new downloads uh, were generated. And because these new downloads, people were spending more time in apps. And the, while they were spending that time, chances are they were spending some money on subscriptions, on in the purchases, and probably some you know, minority, like a small part was spent actually you know, paid apps because they're not uh, you know very significant part of the epic system right now. We're living in the world of subscriptions and in-app purchases. So what signals do these three numbers send to brands uh, this year? And what are these numbers just to reiterate? Yeah. So in terms of you know app store spend, we saw about $143 billion right in consumer spend for the year. Time spent per user, we were at 4.2 hours per person per day. And the new app downloads was that was that 218 billion number. And you know, kind of looking at all these together, what you're really seeing is just that you know, for the vast majority of businesses, mobile should be your, your main area of focus, you know, if you're looking for ways to grow or stay relevant, right? People might come across your service through another, another channel, but if you're looking to engage and retain those users. Mm-hmm. Your best bet is often going to be via mobile, whether it's your own app or making sure that the engagement with your services and in, in another company's app is, is quite strong. So, for example, if you're a restaurant and you don't have your own app, you still want to make sure that your experience is strong with various food delivery systems, because that's how a lot of people are going to be accessing your, your restaurant. Um, and if, if you're not doing that, you know, that's, that's just another barrier to entry to getting someone to, to kind of gain experience with your, with your company. Yeah. And then in thinking about what's going on in various components of mobile, mobile is frequently a lot bigger than, than people realize. So for, for example, you know, consumer spend on mobile gaming is at a hundred billion dollars for, for 2020 is expected to hit $121 billion in, in 2021. And so that's basically one and a half times the size of you know the rest of the gaming market. You know, talking about console or handheld console or PC and Mac. You know, the rest of the gaming market kind of combined. You know, that's how big mobile is. And you know, the types of games people are playing are, are sometimes different, but we're increasingly seeing you know sandbox, arcade, battle royale games becoming popular on on mobile. You're able to see cross platform on mobile versus playing directly against other platforms. And it's the one device that most of your friends will also have access to, uh, you know, even if they're, they're not gaming on their PC or console. So if people are looking to play with their friends, looking to socialize, add in a lot of those components that they, they weren't doing before, you know, that's mm-hmm. really one of the channels they will, uh, they will use for that. And then, you know, on the, on the finance side, right, you know, mobile is kind of that channel for influencing those, those financial uh, decisions. And, and, you know, companies now are having these features that used to be nice to have that are kind of essential to have now, right? Where people are doing things that before would have been just things they may have preferred over doing in person, but now they, they in many cases, have to do versus being in, in person. So people who are using these devices for research, for consideration, for evaluation, and then you know are now feeling comfortable to do purchases and, and investments there as well. So for, for example, time spent in finance apps went up on mobile 45%. Uh, year over year, you know, time spent in, in shopping apps went up 30% year over year. And you, you have traditional shopping, but you know, you also have a lot of influencer related shopping and social and, and live shopping. So not only are the ways that we're engaging with, with mobile, you know, kind of changing, it's also becoming more advanced as well. 
Gotcha. All right. So let's talk about the live TV and mobile. I'm a longtime card cutter. I cut my cord six or seven years ago. And I wonder how much time do people spend these days on mobile versus live TV daily? And what the specific numbers should tell people who are making marketing budgets, allocation decisions. You know, taking a look at what's what's going on in America, we saw people spend about four hours per day on their on their mobile devices, and they spend about three point seven hours per day, uh, you know, per person watching live TV. So we're we finally hit that point where people are spending more time on on their mobile devices than they are watching live TV, and that's that's a really big inflection point. Right. When you think about advertising dollars and, and things like that, you know, TV tends to be a, a lot bigger historically. Uh, but we're starting to finally see some of the advertising budget shift over increasingly towards mobile. You know, again, it's more personalized. It's the device that people always have with them. And, and you know, it's one that people are using increasingly. So we're in a place where it had always been a little bit out of whack, where the percent of advertising that was spent on mobile was always much lower than the amount of time people were spending on it. But not only are we seeing the time increase, we're also seeing the the money increase. And businesses are realizing increasingly that this is you know a key channel that can't just be you know an afterthought. It needs to be a core part of your of your strategy. And you kind of need to know where people are spending their time and how they're spending their time if you want to make those strategic decisions as as a company when you're talking about you know advertising spend or or how you're prioritizing your decision making and how you're allocating those those resources because you want to make sure you're spending it where people are are spending their time and if you're looking at emerging markets you know they're going to be even more mobile centric right and you know, looking at something like India Indonesia Brazil that's going to be more like 5 hours per day on on mobile it's interesting. I wouldn't expect that that shift would actually happen last year because people stuck at home. One would think that it would continue, you know, not continue, or they would switch on watching any, you know, content on their TV set at home. But it looks like people just continue to watch stuff on the iPhones, iPads, even though they're they're just, you know, spending their own the entire awake time at home. So it looks like the TV set is just not, it's not something that people are really want to spend their time on. It's, it's gone, no matter if they're spending the, uh, the bulk of their time outside or inside, it doesn't matter. They're watching Hulu, Netflix, iTunes, or HBO, whatever, on their mobile devices. I would say that you know, TV, TV is, still, is still strong. It's just that you know the the number of options on there versus what you're doing on mobile are going to be you know yeah. a, little, a little bit less right you're only getting a certain type of content on your your TV device versus what you're getting on on mobile although with you know with smart TVs and OTT and and, and things like that right it, 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 some of those options are increasingly going to be available on on TV but in terms of your entertainment options you know quite frequently everything from the TV is available also on the mobile device plus additional types of of entertainment that won't be on the on the TV, but that's that's one of the things that people were wondering what was going to happen during during the pandemic is that some people thought that people would spend less time on their mobile devices, but it's like no, you're actually going to spend more, and you're going to have good bandwidth the whole time, so you can use any of the types of, of apps that you want, even if you don't have you know five G in your your area or, or or things like that. And so that was that was one of the places where we actually saw a considerable uptick in. You know, historically speaking, whenever people have the ability to use their devices more, whether it's you know, longer battery life or better infrastructure or, or more storage, you know, they tend to use their devices more. And this was just another another data point. That's interesting. All right, switching the gears, uh, let's talk about monetization. What do we see globally for both uh, the App Store and Google Play? How much money do app developers make these days? And how is it different from 2019? This is another area where people were wondering originally if there was going to be a little bit of a, of a dip because of the, the pandemic, but we actually saw really big growth from, from the monetization side as well, right? You know, we saw that $143 billion in consumer spend, 20% increase. Uh, so even with everything going on, you know, if, if people are, are cutting budgets, you know, mobile usually isn't the place that they're, they're cutting, or at least not the place that they're, they're cutting first, uh, because most of the purchases that are coming through mobile, is, as we discussed, are... Uh, going to be either in-app purchases or subscriptions, right? You're you're not making a lot of 
you know, $60 or hundred dollar payments, you know, on individual items in, in mobile. Right. So that's, that's kind of one of the, one of the big differences there. And then, you know, from the app stores, what we're seeing is that a lot of companies are able to make really good money on, on the app stores. Yeah. And, and increasingly so we actually saw, you know, even with various forms of consolidation in, in some industries that, that we see, uh, we actually saw, you know, a 25% increase in, in the number of publishers that were earning over $2 million, you know, on, on either store, right? Mm-hmm. But the vast majority of publishers in the space are smaller accounts that are going to make under a million dollars per year in, in consumer spend. And, and quite a few of those are also going to make under $100,000 uh, per year in terms of the spend, although advertising dollars can, can help a lot there. So you, you still see a you know, pretty nice distribution throughout the store. Um, where some are able to make a lot, but you do have a lot of smaller developers on there that are that are still you know finding ways to to monetize. One other thing I'll say for monetization that we're seeing increasingly is that uh, you know a lot of times people were doing either or strategies, right? When it came to monetization in terms of you know, microtransactions or subscriptions or advertising, and now you're seeing a lot more hybrid monetization strategies where you're not doing one or the other. You're doing all of them if if you can, and then you're just trying to find the right monetization strategy for that individual user that is experiencing your app, and that experience that they have. You know, someone could see ads, and then if they're willing to pay for things, then maybe you show them fewer ads. And that system has actually been something that people have found to be very very effective. Yeah, that's smart. That's that's just you're taking into account like the you know. The perceptual difference, like for some people, ads uh, can be that thing they want to turn off and pay a certain amount of money. Some people are, feel more comfortable with subscription because this is their the role and, and every other. Um, uh, they prefer subscription as a matter of, matter of payment. And you can actually test all these options and uh, separate folks who are preferring ads and in, in-app purchases, subscriptions. That's interesting. Continue the money talk. What app technologies attract the biggest venture capital investments, and uh, what are the you know the overall number of how much money was invested into app ecosystem last year? Yeah. So in terms of the the VC investment, this is where we saw that seventy three billion dollars again, up twenty seven percent from from twenty nineteen. Uh, and this is this is kind of more than double than what we were seeing five to six years ago. So it's grown. Quite considerably in a, in a very short period of, of time, which makes sense, you know, kind of aligning itself when, when mobile has also been growing uh, yeah. throughout the world. Um, you know, the really big industries in, in the space are the ones that you're going to be hearing a lot, a lot about in, in the news, right? You're, there's a lot of investment in financial services, transportation, commerce, and, and shopping, right? And one of the things is that these industries, you know, for the most part, have, have like some form of them, right, have been around for for quite a long time. And so, what's really going on is it's about integrating these industries with more advanced tech, you know, kind of taking it to that that next level uh, to be more more user friendly and more on demand, and offering more services than were available before. So again, think about you know, a company like like DoorDash or or Uber or Robinhood. Right. You know, these are companies that exist in sectors, uh, you know, whether it's, it's transportation or, or food or you know, financial services. These are industries that have been around for a while, uh, but there's just a lot more functionality that exists now versus before and a lot more integrated tech to be able to you know, bring those solutions to a, a greater number of people. And, you know, with that, people become more active in these industries than they than they have been before. You know, the existence of some of these financial services apps you know, made it that people were much more engaged with their finances and with the stock market. Again, just because that mobile device is one of convenience, it's the one that you have with you. It's a lot easier to check in on things on a regular basis when you're able to do it with something that you might already be using versus having to go, you know, to your to your laptop in a, in a different room. Right. Totally makes sense. Gotcha. Now let's talk about generations, generations of app users. So what specific apps different age folks were spending their time with last year? Yeah, so I mean, with with generations, it's the the growth is everywhere, right? We're seeing growth uh, across the board. You know, looking at what's going on in you know a country like the U.S., you know, Gen Z, millennials, and you know people that might be in the you know the Gen X or Baby Boomer group, like people over the age of forty five. You know, we're seeing them increase their their time by sixteen percent, eighteen percent, and and thirty percent. 
year over year in terms of their their most used apps. So everyone's growing, everyone's showing a lot of growth, but in many markets, the biggest growth you're actually seeing is from people you know aged 45 plus. And that's that's kind of interesting. Uh, I mean, some of that you could say, oh, you know, people from younger age groups are moving into older age groups. And so they're just taking their, their mobile habits in, into the other yeah, group. Right. And, and to some extent, that's, that's true. Uh, but the other thing that we're seeing is, you know, for this advancement of mobile by two to three years, you know, what have we meant by that, right? On some level, it's, hey, there's increased focus on mobile by companies. There's increased functionality. People are including more social, more augmented reality and, and things like that. They're, they're moving mobile up their, their roadmap. So there's just more features there. But the other thing is just increased user desire for, for these solutions as well. And a lot of that increased desire, it would make sense, would come from a group that maybe hadn't been as mobile centric before. So you have people you know, experimenting with apps that maybe otherwise they wouldn't have tried in 2020. You know, maybe they wouldn't have started considering you know, using their app for finances or, or food delivery until 2021 or 2022 or, or maybe never. But with everything going on, a lot more people were invested in trying to figure out how to engage with services via via that method in 2020. And one of the things that happens is once you realize you know, the usefulness and convenience of mobile, once you get that experience, you know, you're much more likely to stick with that than you are if you've you know kind of never never tried it and you're trying to be converted for for the first time, right? And so we've seen studies that say. I think it's, you know, it takes 66 days to establish, you know, habits for habits, for right. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're, we're well past 66 days at this point, right? So, so there's a That's lot of so sure. habits that are being developed right now, which is why it's so important for people to focus on, on user acquisition at, at this point. Um, so you have a lot of people that maybe either weren't as active or weren't trying out some of these apps that are, that are now engaging with them. And then if, if you look at some of the apps where, you know, hey, maybe you over index more on, on some, uh, demographics versus other, you know, Gen Z, you know, ev- everyone uses the big apps, but Gen Z, you're going to see a greater percentage of them on you know, Snapchat and Twitch and, and TikTok. You know, millennials are going to be more on on Discord and LinkedIn and, and people over the age of 45, they're still using, you know, a lot of the big apps, but you see a greater percentage of them on things like Kindle and, and Nextdoor and, and Ring. But one thing that's pretty important across the age group is just social components across verticals are increasingly important because people are looking for ways to, to connect with others. So not only does it help in terms of adding new users and help with retention, it's helping kind of fill that, that need for connection that's, that's very big right now. You know, I think the outcome from what you're saying is this, it would be a mistake to be concentrated specifically on Gen Z only because your data shows that across generations, the mobile usage increased just no matter what specific categories or apps see the higher level of engagement, the higher level of usage for a specific age. I think my last point, my last question will be this. Um, every year, Apple introduced a new version of iOS, right? You know, WWDC, this is the time when people are um, you know, being introduced to the new version of uh, iOS or for Google. I don't remember the timing for Google, but Let's, let's focus on iOS uh, this time only. So after polishing you know, through the multiple updates, uh, through its beta version, Apple finally releases the uh, next iOS version in the fall. So what can we tell about the adoption for iOS 14 last year versus uh, iOS 13 the year before? What's the difference? Yeah, you know, one one of the interesting things about this is, you know, iOS 14 launched in September 2020 and iOS 13 launched in September 2019, and they're frequently tied to you know new devices. So, uh, yeah. from an adoption standpoint, you can actually, you know, it, it helps a lot with looking at the seasonality that you know the the release structure is is so similar between the between the two. And for iOS 14, it was it was kind of interesting because in in the beginning, compared to iOS 13, for the first you know five or six weeks, it was actually lagging a, a little bit behind. But then by week 10, week 11, you're at a point where iOS 14 was close to you know, like 75% adoption versus week 10 or 11 for iOS 13, that was a little over 30% adoption. So, you know, it's just kind of showing how quickly everyone is gaining access to, to new tech, you know, via those devices and, and that OS and how that how quickly people are kind of upgrading to that tech has, has increased significantly from one year, one year to the next. And one of the big things to, to keep an eye out on for that is just, you know, when, when 
people are making content or, or they're making their apps, you know, they're trying to make sure it can work for whatever type of update people are using on, on their devices, right? If you have something that's working, you know, if, if it's split, you know, even if it's split 75% versus 25%, you know, you need to make sure it's optimized for iOS 14 and iOS 13. And in some cases, maybe some, some older ones as well. You just need to understand like how dispersed that, that tail is. But if you see that 75% are kind of upgrading to that new system very early, you need to make sure you're able to do everything with that new system quite, quite quickly. And especially with updates that they're doing, you know, for, for IDFA or, or other things like that. Uh, you just need to make sure that you're 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 kind of ahead of the curve for for how quickly people will be uh, you know affected by whatever new updates are on the the new OS and and the speed by which that is happening you know, actually increased. Okay, so that was my last question, but I think the very last question will be how can people get to know more about the state of mobile 2020, 2021 report. Yeah. So if, if, you, if you want, you know, kind of an easy URL to remember, you can go to stateofmobile2021.com. So if you only remember stateofmobile2021.com, mm-hmm. that's a very easy way to, to get to the report. So you can see, you know, the actual breakouts that we have for all these different verticals and deeper dives on, on marketing and advertising. You know, we talk about, you know, some, some things where it's like, hey, you know, you can actually see some of the impact of you know, what Travis Scott had when they were hosting concerts in Fortnite and, and, you know, what did that do to that, that app experience or what happens when Calm works with, with Harry Styles. So you can some, get some additional insight there. Uh, you can also go just to the, the App Annie blog for more information as well. So there you'll be able to see, of course, the State of Mobile report, but you'll also be able to see a lot of other additional content on, you know, not only what's going on in, in the app economy, but also why it would be important for, for you and, and what actions companies should be taking you know, kind of based on on that information. So some of the the things that we have recently, we've had a story about social audio apps. Uh, so talking a lot about Clubhouse and and you know kind of where we see that industry going and how that adoption has been very very quick. You know even with the the kind of invite only uh, method that they've that they've had there, which is you know based on on activity within the app, which is kind of an, an interesting twist on on that narrative. And then another piece of content we had recently was was something kind of talking about uh, like a new metric we created called performance score, uh, which gives you like a, a 360 degree view of your your mobile performance. So you kind of you it, it's a score that looks at your user acquisition, your engagement, your monetization, and then it helps you quickly understand the full picture of your app's overall health. So you can kind of see how it's performing in these these sectors, and then how that compares to other verticals or, or, or other apps in your vertical as well. Uh, so you can get a good sense of your, your overall health and, and what you would need to improve to improve that, which is, which is really cool. So you go to App Annie blog, you can see all this fun stuff there. That's really cool. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time and coming on our podcast, Amir. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's great. It was great being back. Terrific. Bye-bye. And that was Amir Gadradi, Director of Market Insights at App Any. To listen to more episodes, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. Just search for Business of Apps and you will find us easily. We release episodes on Mondays, so subscribe and you will be able to get new episodes on your smartphone, tablet, or computer as soon as we release them. And please don't forget to leave us a review or comment on iTunes. It is highly appreciated. And all episodes will also be available on businessofapps.com. Thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com.